This part of the test will measure your listening ability when it comes to the conversations and lectures in academic settings. You will listen to a recording and then answer questions about it. You will be able to take notes while listening and you can listen to the recording only once. The questions must be answered in the presented order. During the exam, you will not be allowed to go back to the previous question. The questions will be about the main idea and the supporting details. Some questions will be about the speaker's purpose or attitude. Answer the questions based on what is stated or implied by the speaker. Sometimes you will see this icon. It means that you will have to listen to a certain segment of the recording and answer a question about it. Now listen to the lecture. Today, we'll talk about the intricate processes involved in making porcelain. Around 200 BC, during the Han Dynasty in China, porcelain first appeared. However, it wasn't until the Tang Dynasty the porcelain production method started to really advance. During this time, a composition that could endure high temperatures during firing was made using a combination of clay and a mineral known as feldspar, allowing for a pure, translucent product. The famed blue and white porcelain made its debut during the Yuan Dynasty when porcelain production reached unprecedented heights. These elaborate patterns, which frequently represented images from nature, were made possible by the use of cobalt oxide in these designs. This mineral, which was imported from Persia, was crucial in producing the characteristic blue color. In order to get the desired result, cobalt oxide was combined with a transparent glaze and fired at high temperature. The invention of the kiln during the Ming Dynasty was one of the most significant advancements in the manufacture of porcelain. The long, brick-built kiln, sometimes known as the dragon kiln, could maintain continuously high temperatures. In order to give porcelain the desired hardness, translucency, and vitrification, fire was essential. Let's now discuss European porcelain. Eventually, in the 18th century, they started making their own versions. The first successful porcelain producing facility in Europe was the Meissen porcelain manufactory in Germany. They used several methods, but they also included their own tastes and aesthetics, such as painting and gilding. Industrialization increased in porcelain production over the 19th and 20th centuries. The democratization of porcelain was made possible by new technology which made it possible to produce goods more quickly and effectively. Now, everybody could enjoy porcelain. It was no longer just for the elite. The production of porcelain in the modern era has now mainly been commercialized. However, some artists continue to use time-honored methods which call for great skill and perseverance. Due to a lack of funding and desire, many of these abilities are unfortunately disappearing. A huge loss, one that the wide world isn't aware of. It is comparable to the realm of graffiti, where prefabricated designs frequently obscure real artist talent. To sum up, tremendous advancements and breakthroughs in porcelain production over the years have produced one-of-a-kind, breathtaking works of art. Despite the difficulties in maintaining traditional methods, porcelain is still prized for its beauty and roughness. What is the main idea of a lecture? The blue color in blue and white porcelain is derived from which material? How does the professor feel about the loss of traditional porcelain making techniques?
How did the production of porcelain change during the 19th and 20th centuries? Which European factory was the first to successfully produce porcelain? Why does the professor mention the world of graffiti? Now listen to the conversation between two people. Hello, Professor. I'm struggling to grasp the concept of the Industrial Revolution. Can you help me? Of course. I'd suggest visiting the local history museum, as it has some great exhibits on the topic. I've been there already, but I'm still not getting the complete picture. Do you have any other suggestions? Yes, try reading primary sources like newspapers and journals from the era to gain a deeper understanding. That sounds helpful, but sometimes those sources can be a bit dense. I understand. You may find documentaries on the subject to be more accessible and engaging. That might be more my style. I think I remember seeing one recently, but I'm not quite sure if it covers the whole period. It's possible. Don't hesitate to watch multiple documentaries to get different perspectives and cover various aspects of the topic. Thank you, Professor. Your advice is much appreciated. I feel much more confident about tackling this subject now. I'm glad to help. Remember, history is often about exploring different perspectives to develop a more comprehensive understanding. That's a great point. I never thought of it that way. Good luck on your journey. And don't hesitate to reach out if you have any further questions. Thank you. I'll keep that in mind. You're welcome. Happy learning. Have a great day, Professor. You too. Take care. What is the main topic of the dialogue? The professor's suggestion for the student to watch documentaries is based on which of the following implications? Which of the following best describes the professor's attitude toward the student's difficulty in understanding the topic?
What does the professor mean with this statement? History is often about exploring different perspectives. How does the student feel after talking to the professor? Now listen to the lecture. Today we will examine a work of art by the great Leonardo da Vinci that is less well-known, La Tempesta. Although less well-known than some of his other pieces like The Last Supper or The Mona Lisa, this work has special value in Leonardo's body of work and offers a chance to delve into the themes of nature, human emotion, and technical ingenuity that he frequently explored. La Tempesta, or The Storm, created a scene of a severe storm raging over a little settlement. The artwork is a study in contrast, the warm golden light seeping through the dark foreboding clouds hovering above the settlement. The villagers themselves seem awestruck and frightened by the storm's overwhelming power. This piece is another example of Leonardo's talent for evoking human feeling. As the villagers look for safety from the storm, one can practically feel their strain and worry. Leonardo's love for the natural world and his scientific approach to portraying it are evident in this picture. The wind gusts and droplets are painstakingly represented, demonstrating his profound mastery of meteorological phenomena. While the gloomy clouds are depicted in a way that emphasizes their great strength, Leonardo's primary point is that nature is a double-edged sword, creating beauty and destruction at the same time. The storm serves as the focal point of the composition, which is extremely impressive and draws the viewer's attention throughout the entire canvas. The peasants' dispersed bodies and varied facial expressions produce a dynamic feeling of movement that echoes the storm's frantic fury. The painting's diagonal lines created by the lightning and rain help to guide the viewer's eye around the picture by giving it a sense of depth and movement. Although it is a lesser-known piece, La Tempesta nonetheless reflects Leonardo's inventive style. In order to get a smoky atmospheric impression, he used his well-known Sufmoto method, which involves the careful blending of colors. The Mona Lisa, which is the most well-known example of this method, shows Leonardo pushing the limits of what was conceivable with paint. Leonardo once referred to the picture as not only a storm, but a reflection of the human condition, alluding to the underlying theme of human frailty in the face of nature's might. It serves as a sobering reminder that despite our successes and developments, nature still has its whims. Finally, Leonardo da Vinci's La Tempesta is a magnificent little-known piece that gives us a chance to consider his mastery of capturing both the natural world and human emotion. We learn more about Leonardo's brilliance as a result of investigating the themes of nature, human fragility, and technological progress, and the painting itself becomes a crucial component of his artistic legacy. What is the main idea of the lecture?
What did the professor mean when they said, Nature is a double-edged sword, creating beauty and destruction at the same time. What did the professor mean when they said, Not only a storm, but a reflection of the human condition. Why does the professor say, that, La Tempesta, bears Leonardo's characteristic innovative touch? What does the diagonal lines formed by the lightning and rain, in, la, tempesta, contribute to the painting? Sort the following elements as either part of the painting, la, tempesta, or not part of the painting. Now listen to the conversation between two people. Hi, Professor. I need help with my architecture project on the campus redesign. Of course. Can you tell me what specific aspect you need assistance with? I'm struggling with incorporating sustainable design elements into my plan. Well, there are many ways to approach sustainability. Have you considered using energy-efficient materials or incorporated green spaces? Yes, but I'm not sure how to choose the right materials and create a cohesive design. A good starting point is researching materials that minimize waste and energy use. Then, think about integrating natural light and ventilation into your design. That's a good idea. I was also thinking of incorporating some water management systems, like rainwater harvesting. What are your thoughts on that? That's an excellent idea. Rainwater harvesting is a great way to conserve water and reduce the campus's overall environmental impact. You could also explore gray water recycling and green roofs to further enhance your project's sustainability. I appreciate the advice. I also want to include some innovative technologies, but I feel overwhelmed by the choices. It's natural to feel that way. My recommendation is to focus on a few key technologies that align with your project's goals and the overall campus vision. Thank you, Professor. I feel more confident in tackling the project now. Do you have any suggestions for resources or websites where I could find more information on sustainable architecture? Absolutely. The U.S. Green Building Council and the International Living Future Institute 
have excellent resources on their websites. Additionally, you can explore architectural journals and case studies from similar projects to gather more ideas. That's really helpful, Professor. I'll definitely check those out. Uh, one last question. How can I effectively present my ideas to the campus administration to get their approval and support? Be clear and concise about your design objectives and how they align with the campus's overall vision. Highlight the environmental, social, and economic benefits of your proposed design. Providing visual aids like renderings or 3D models, that can also help them understand your concept better. Thank you so much for your help, Professor. I'm excited to work on my project with these new ideas and resources. What is the main idea of the dialogue? How does the student feel about incorporating innovative technologies into their project? What is the professor's attitude towards the student's concerns? What does the professor suggest as a starting point for the student's sustainable design? What additional advice does the professor give for presenting the project to the campus administration? Now listen to the lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, today we will explore the interesting world of the flying lizard, or Draco volans. Small, arboreal lizards like the Draco volans are indigenous to Southeast Asia, specifically Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Philippines. By creating wing-like structures called patagia, they enable them to glide from tree to tree. These unusual creatures have adapted to their environment in a fascinating way. Let me go into more detail about these amazing creatures. 
Their bodies contain extended ribs that project outward and support a thin skin membrane called the patagium. The patagium extends when the lizard expands its limbs, forming a structure resembling wings. They can avoid predators and navigate their woodland habitat more effectively because of this adaptability. The proverb, adapt or perish, might be said to be perfectly embodied by the Draco volans. This species uses a variety of vivid hues, including blue, green, and red, to help in communication and camouflage. Let's now look at their special gliding prowess. Despite not being able to fly like birds, they have skilled gliders and can travel up to 30 feet in a single glide. In order to gain height, they use updrafts. Once airborne, they glide through trees in search of food or to avoid potential predators. They can change the angle of their patagia in midair, which is an intriguing part of their gliding behavior. They can keep control during their airborne adventures thanks to this. Being insectivores, Dracovolans primarily eat termites, ants, and other small insects. They snake insects off tree bark and leaves with the use of their lengthy, sticky tongues. In order to keep the forest environment in balance, this diet is essential since it helps to regulate insect populations. As a result, these little but formidable organisms play a crucial role in the stability and health of the forest. In addition to their ability to glide and their distinctive nutrition, Dracovolans have an unusual reproductive method. Unlike the majority of arboreal lizards, which lay their eggs in trees, females lay their eggs in tiny holes they dig in the ground. Choosing to lay their eggs on the ground is a calculated risk that has ensured their survival over the millennia. After the eggs are placed, the female will watch over the nest to protect her young. In summary, the Draco volans is a remarkable animal whose special adaptions have allowed it to flourish in its natural habitat. These flying lizards provide a fascinating look into the wonders of the natural world and the significance of adaptions in the face of adversity, from their wing-like patagia to their unique reproductive techniques. What is the main idea of the lecture? What does the professor imply when saying? The proverb, adapt or perish, might be said to be perfectly embodied by the Draco Volans. What does the professor mean by calculated risk that has ensured their survival over the millennia? What is the professor implying about the relationship between the Draco Volans and the forest ecosystem?
Why does the professor say the Draco Volans uses vibrant colors in communication? Why does the professor mention the ability of the Draco Volans to maneuver midair, by adjusting the angle of their patagia? <laughs> 